Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com and in this video we're going to talk a little bit about the 2021 rapture timeline that I published back in 2018 that I believe still has some merit. And I want to talk about one particular word in the Bible that tends to scare a lot of Christians. It's the word blasphemy, but it has nothing to do with blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's just simply the word blasphemy. And what it means and how relevant I believe that word is today, uh, especially when we take a look around us and we see what's going on, both in the world and in the, the current religious establishment as well. So we're going to talk about that. This will be somewhat of a prophecy update. Uh, one I haven't done one of those in quite some time. If you've been following this channel, you know we've been talking about a lot of other various topics that pertain to spiritual growth, but we are headed into uh, this uh, well, we're going into that final year, that countdown, you know, to 2021. You know, this is already June, so we are just a little less than one year until Pentecost, which is May 17, 2021. And for those of you who are new to this channel, who, or for those of you who haven't seen that, that, that accumulated data that, that I believe helps, uh, support the possibility of a spring 2021 rapture uh, you might find this interesting for those of you who are familiar with it many of you are uh, in fact I, I know of, of some of our followers who have actually memorized the timeline uh, it is an, an impressive timeline uh, date wise that doesn't mean that the uh, I'm not being dogmatic about you know saying that the rapture is going to occur on any date. My emphasis is on the how impressive the timeline is date-wise. Uh, I haven't seen anything like it uh, on the web uh, since I first published it back in 2018. So we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about the word blasphemy. So first, the 2021 timeline, uh, according to the Hebrew calendar, uh, Torah calendar, the first day of creation was May 5, 3980 BC, May 5, 3980 BC. Uh, Jesus was crucified March 23, 34 AD. Jesus was raised then March 28. He appears for 40 days to May 5 which would be the day that he ascended. That's uh, his ascension date, which just happens to be the first day of creation, May 5, 39 80, 80 BC. Uh, simply put, according to Torah calendar, they show the first day of creation is May 5, 39 80 BC. Now, given the fact that the, that, uh, the, resurre the crucifixion year according to the Torah calendar, was 34 A.D. Then he would have raised in 34 A.D. And when you look at May 5, 34 A.D., that would be the day that he would have ascended. Now, I find that uh, fairly interesting. But so, you know, let's go on. Ten days later, on May 14, is the first Pentecost. That would be the start of the church and the date of Israel's rebirth in 1948. And I'm going... I'm looking at that and I'm going, wow, that's, that's really impressive. 
And from uh, 39 AD BC to 2021 AD, well, that just happens to be exactly 6,000 years. So now I'm, I'm three times impressive here. Are you following along with this? Impressed three times. Now Pentecost in 2021 is May 17. If the, if the rapture occurs on that date, if it occurs on that date, ending on a Pentecost on which it began, well, that would be impressive. Christ would have to return 2550 days later on May 10, 2028. Now May 10 is the date of the sixth day of creation when Adam was created. May 5, first day of creation. May 10, Adam's created. Well, that's interesting. And it just goes on, folks, and it just gets better. I mean, I would be derelict in my duty if I didn't point out to you folks these numbers and these dates and how impressive that they are. Now, it's up to you on what you do with them. Uh, they've impressed me so much that I've stood by this timeline uh, since the fall, September, I believe, of 2018. And I haven't seen anything that even comes anywhere near to being as impressive as, the, as this timeline is date-wise. Okay, so let's look at the tribulation midpoint. Well, that would be November 27, 2024, when the two witnesses are killed. Well, it just so happens that the following day would be, and I Googled this, you know, I Googled Thanksgiving of 2024, and it happens to be on the 28th. So the following day is Thanksgiving, would be November 28, 2024, which Really, we all know that marks the beginning of the Christmas shopping season when people are sending gifts to one another, which is exactly what they do when the two witnesses are killed. On Pentecost, May 17, 2021, Israel is 73. 73 years old. She became a nation again uh, in 1948, so 2021 should be 73. The Hebrew calendar crucifixion year was 34 A.D. The first Pentecost in 34 A.D. just happened to be Israel's rebirth date, May 14. Now, a 2021 rapture would see Jesus return in 2028 when Israel is, guess what, 80. 80. 8 equals new beginning. We know 8 equals new beginning. 1948 plus 80 will always uh, equal 20, 28. Minus 7 years equals 2021. We're, that brings us back to the, a potential 2021 departure date uh, for the church. Now, if May 17 is the rapture, Let's say it is. Let's say May 17 is the rapture. Eight days later, eight days later, on May 25th, there's a total lunar eclipse. Eight days later. Now, this will be the first total lunar eclipse after the rapture takes place. Tour calendar shows that there was a total lunar eclipse on May 17, 3980 B.C., the date of our rapture in 2021 which would have been Adam's eighth day, by the way, which, which would have been Adam's first eclipse. So May 17, 3980, Adam's eighth day, to May 17, 2021, Pentecost, equals 6,000 years. Now, that would suggest that the 6,000-year count would have begun when Adam was eight years old. It, it would have been the day God gave Adam dominion or rule over everything that he created, which was to last for 6,000 years. The, uh, the eighth millennium, I know that's a, it's a phrase you probably never heard of. If I may use that phrase, the eighth millennium, would define a period where that the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth ends, you know, the seventh millennium ends, and eternity begins with the creation of the new heavens and new earth. Of course, we know there's no time 
time is no more, but eight al always, it always equals new beginning. In this case, it would represent both the beginning of mankind's 6,000 year rule, as well as the beginning of the eternal state. You know, definitely a new beginning. May 10, creation of Adam to May 17, 2021, 6,000 years and seven days. God rested on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Therefore, May 18, 2021, may begin our eternal Sabbath rest. Now, we know that a rapture, you know, to return, I've pointed this out so many times, a rat, if you just count the days that are given in Scripture of, of the events that unfold, the rapture to return is always 2550 days. Therefore, the church would depart on the feast day in which it began in 34 AD, Pentecost, and Christ would return on the date God created Adam. It's interesting that according to Torah calendar, the first Pentecost, the beginning of the church, was May 14, 34 AD. The exact date that Israel re was reborn in 1948, the church being born on the date Israel was reborn. Coincidence? The midpoint, let's talk about that. That's where the two witnesses are killed and the abomination of desolation occurs. That would be November 27, 2024. That's 28 days before Christmas and the first day of Hanukkah, December 25. Hanukkah that year just happens to align itself with Christmas. And so people send gifts to one another. So we have a beginning date, the rapture, okay? The, we have an ending date and we have a midpoint that are all impressive. The uh, second coming date. May 10 is on a new moon. Christ would defeat his enemies. The sheep and goats would be judged. And the following day counts would, would, would follow to the, to the three remaining fall feasts. Uh, he would return and it'd be 50 days to trumpets. It'd be 70 days to atonement. 73 to the eve of Sukkot, uh, the day before the first day of tabernacles. And it'd be 80 days exact to the eighth Eighth day, solemn assemb assembly, Sh Shemini Atzeret, 80 days exact. That's just how it works out. 50, 70, 73, and 80. So, you know, I, I tried to tell people in the, the, the first video on this, what, what, what a November 27 midpoint, what would that remind the Jews of historically? You know, 25 Kislev in Jewish history. Well, uh, without going through all the, all the years, the dates, it, we see that the foundation of the Second Temple was complete. Uh, the portable sanctuary in the wilderness was completed. Hanukkah was established. So that midpoint, those midpoint dates, the midpoint dates on this timeline are also impressive uh, it, as far as their connection to Jewish history. We've seen all the number of, uh, of sevens associated with Trump. We've, um, and, and that, that list seems to keep on growing. You know, exact, just there's a lot of them. I'm not going to bother going through them all, but exactly seven months from his first full day in office. Uh, on January 21, 2017, we had the August 21st, 2017 Great American Solar Eclipse. You know, uh, the first uh, since before the nation was was formed in 1776. To be to be seen exclusively in the U.S. alone, which divided the country in half. And even on uh, June 14, 1946, the day that Trump was born, uh, there was a total lunar eclipse. Of course, many of you know he's born on Flag Day. If the rapture occurs on Pentecost, May 17, 2021, a total solar eclipse again crosses out America in the first half of the tribulation period on April 8, 2024. And you know, Trump's not just a, he doesn't seem to be, just be associated with sevens, but also ones. 
you know, from that August 21st eclipse to the Feast of Trumpets, uh, the year Christ would return, happens to be 11 years, one month, that's, that's 111, seven times 111 is 777. It, it's not only sevens that seem to follow this president. On the 1,111th day of Trump's president, presidency, he's acquitted of charges relating to impeachment. 1,111th day of his presidency. I stumbled on that fact just after watching the uh, impeachment hearings and watching him being acquitted. Went to the calculator and I just I, I stumbled on that one 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 one. If if Trump begins a second term, it'll be if he does begin a second term, it'll be 111 days inclusive to Pentecost, May 17, 2021. Find that interesting. In between Pentecost, May 17, 2021, and Feast of Trumpets is 111 days. Uh, you know, the, the, and the number one in the Bible symbolizes the unity and the oneness of the Godhead. So beginning with our rapture date, Pentecost, May 17, 2021, uh, 30 days forward to the beginning of the Two Witnesses Ministry is June 16, 2021. That's the fifth day of the fourth month of Tammuz on the Hebrew calendar. This, is, this would be when the tribulation would begin. Uh, and I, I pointed out the connection there with, with that in Ezekiel 1.1, okay, where uh, he saw a vision of God. It's almost a whole video in itself, folks, but the beginning of the tribulation period in the ministry of the two witnesses would occur on the same date on the calendar that Ezekiel received his vision from God. So I, I challenge you to read the first few chapters of Ezekiel. Uh, I've explained the 1290 days, you know, from the rapture to the midpoint. That's where it takes you into Ezekiel's vision. Now, creation day one, May 5, 3980 B.C., to the kingdom date, that's, that's the, the end of our timeline, July 24, 2028. That's 6,007 years and 80 days. So that's what it comes out to be. Rosh Chadesh, September 20, 2017, to, to the rapture, uh, May 17, 2021, is 1335. That kind of mirrors the, that's, you know, that's the same number of days from the midpoint to the kingdom. We know, we know that, uh, that Enoch was born in 622 after creation, that he lived 360 years and he was taken, that, that means he would have been taken in 987 after creation. Uh, 3980 B.C. being the, the year of, of creation minus 987 is, is 2993 B.C. That would, have been, that would have been when Enoch, a type of the rapture, was taken 2993 B.C. Now 2993, okay, if you add 2020 to that, it gives you 50, 12 years. Well, when you cross over from B.C. to A.D., you know, you, you don't count the year zero. So to, to, the, to the 2021, it, you know, it's 512 years since Enoch was taken. 500, uh, or 5,012. 5,012. Okay? Uh, I took a little bit of research, but 5, 000, I wanted to know this. 5,012 years since Enoch was taken, who was the type of the rapture? That's 5,012 years from, the, from you know, uh, that's, two, two, that's up to the 2021 20, date. Well, I didn't know what to do with 5,012 years, but what I did was I divided a jubilee into it. If, it, if you count 50 years as a jubilee, well, it just happens to be 100 jubilees exact since Enoch was taken. All right. And here we are now 12 years into the 
to the 100th Jubilee since Enoch was taken. Bet you didn't know that. So, I mean, look, if, if you want a timeline, you, you people that, you know, and I've, I've gone on and I, you know, many, I lost many followers by going on teaching verse by verse and I left all that sort of in the dust because I didn't really have anything else to say. I had put out a timeline I thought was impressive. You know, if you want a timeline that's, that's, that's really impressive date-wise, I've given it to you. I've given it to you. And I'm just gonna, and I'm gonna go on. I believe time's short and I believe there's a lot of work to be done. If, if Christ does not return for us then, then uh, I'm not to be blamed for such an impressive timeline since that, that's all it is, the timeline. God doesn't have to use that timeline. But those are the numbers and those are the facts. There's little doubt His return for us is near. I believe, I believe the greatest sign of, of, of what is seen, if you, want, if you really want some blessed hope here, folks, I believe the greatest sign of that, of His near return, is seen in one word, blasphemy. That's right, the word blasphemy. I, you know, I, who would have thought, who would have thought that we, you know, one of the greatest signs of his near return would be uh, seen in the word blasphemy, but it, it all hinges on the definition of the term and how God defines the term in his word. And it's very interesting how that when you look at the, the actual biblical definition of the word blasphemy and you take a look around you at the world at large, It's impossible not to say that we are it's living in, a, in an age, an unprecedented age. I, I refer to it as the age of blasphemy. And it's unlike any other. Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This deadness to moral distinctions is the sign of deep moral corruption. And it is, I believe, the single greatest, most sure sign of our Lord's return being near. We're now living more than ever in the age of Strong's Greek number 988, blasphemy. This uh, calling good evil and evil good, this reverse syndrome, which the world for the past 400 years has seen in Christianity is now being seen more than ever before in religion, in human culture, institutions, education, uh, society in general, government, politics, uh, and the entertainment industry. I mean, just it's, it's everywhere, folks. And Satan single-handedly, he constructed a counterfeit Christianity with one simple two-letter English word, and that is the word if. If man does something, God will then then act, you know, as if his grace depended upon a reversal of grace's own definition, which is unmerited favor. New birth being dependent upon man's will, not God's, as it says in John 1.13. And as a result of this backwards theology, the modern church has failed in becoming a force for positive spiritual change or good in the world, which is now more than ever being reflected in society as a whole. The lump has always had leaven, but not to the extent in which we are seeing it today. As a general rule, even those who do have ears to hear, they keep wondering why those who don't have ears to hear don't hear, which, which reflects that leaven of synergism. It is not cause and effect on the part of those who do not have ears to hear. You know, we, we tend to, to point fingers and say, well, if they, it's because they're doing this or that or the other thing, or, or if they would just do this or that or the other thing, if they'd study more, if they'd, if they'd just, you know, witness more, if, they, if they'd go to church more, if they just did this or that or the other thing. Folks, it is not because they have itching ears and, and are concerned about the affairs of this world or anything else. That's not the reason why they cannot hear. All of that is a byproduct or a result of not having ears to hear, which, which is only overcome by an act of God's grace and mercy. What we want to do is put the cart before the horse. You know, we want to reverse God's order. 
The reverse is actually true. We only do because God first did, which is a byproduct of His work rather than our own. We love Him because He first loved us. We don't love Him so that He will love us. Now, I know I'm slaughtering a sacred cow here, but contrary to popular belief, obedience does not bring God's blessings. Don't let them lie to you. Obedience is a result of His already having blessed us. But that truth has been reversed. It's been corrupted to the point that that corruption has taken it upon itself to assume a moral high ground where it feels compelled to call good evil and evil good. You know, like I can just hear people out there calling me evil right now for saying this. God is the cause. He always has been. He always will be. We are the effect, folks. We're, we're the effect. We're not the cause. Oh, we do obey, but we do, we do so as a result of what He's done, is doing, and will do in our lives. Maturity recognizes this. Carnality does, doesn't. Legalism doesn't. Common sense doesn't. Common sense says we live in a cause and effect world, and that may be true as far as your shoelaces becoming untied and it causing you to trip and fall. But, but the, it, the reverse is actually true in the spiritual sense. We can't do anything to cause God to love us more or become more righteous than what we already are in Christ or please Him anymore. We have been accepted in the Beloved, Jesus Christ. That's where we started, folks. We began on that ground. We began on that basis, on the ground of acceptance. We're called to live like who we are, not to try and become something that we think we're not, which is a struggle that leads nowhere. To preach obedience first and blessing second is to reverse God's order and preach law, not grace. We couldn't be any closer to Him than what we are right now. It's all about the order. Him first, us second. Not us first, Him second. That's grace. If we view our lives in Christ thinking that, it, well, if we just do what's right, God will bless us if we do, it reveals a wrong motive on our part because it is all viewed as if it is something earned. Christians need to know God has nothing against them, that His grace is sufficient, that He continues to bless them regardless of personal failure, that the sin issue has been forever settled. We've looked at all of these truths, folks, in these verse-by-verse -verse videos that we've studied through. These are truths that God gave us. When we look at the biblical definition of blasphemy, we might expect that to be the, the attitude of the world in these final days and a sure sign of our Lord's near return, even more so when we come to realize that this reflects the mindset of the majority of so-called Christianity today, which is a religious system based on human merit, having reversed God's order, preaching law, not grace, which defines the very word blasphemy. We blaspheme the, the person and the work of Christ. And Christians, by the droves, are doing this without even realizing that they're doing so. It is not uncommon for legalists to call grace believers evil while they call themselves spiritual because they are the ones that are trying harder, working, striving harder. You know, they've got that heavy yoke of law hung around their neck a price that only Christ could pay, they're trying to pay. A precise definition of blasphemy, re reversing God's truth concerning the believer, resulting in lying against that, that truth. And folks, God's faithfulness is not dependent upon anything we do. He isn't trying to clean up the flesh, clean up the old man, which profits nothing. He's not trying to get us to make the flesh acceptable to Him. We are dead to sin, alive unto Christ. We are to daily reckon that to be true, Romans 6, 11. He doesn't give us strength. He is our strength. Big difference. We often beseech God to do for us what we, He's already done for us in Christ. We're all the time doing that. Please, Lord, give me 
such and such or the other, this or that or the other thing. And, and God says, I have. We grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, not a human merit-based religious system based on old and worn out, you know, well-tested but failed methods and formulas. It's when we are weak that He is strong. Folks, it's little wonder our Lord referred to, the, to this reverse man-centered, self-centered, fleshly, legalistic, law-oriented religious system as the world a religious system which believes man, not God, is ultimately sovereign, that such a system dominates the religious scene today shouldn't surprise us when it dominated the religious scene of his day, his time. We only have to go back a few decades, folks, to see that human society was not so heavily governed and dictated by such a reversal where good and evil were, for the most part, you know, properly defined. But that's not the world we live in today. The blasphemy that has permeated the religious system for the past 400 years has spilled over into society as a whole, which is one of the greatest evidences, I believe, of our Lord's near return. Those of you who are old enough, you know, like me, or older even, you know what I'm talking about. You know that this was not the world that we knew before. Tell me that this isn't true. We also know who's behind this reversal. He delights in reversing God's truth in the general order of things. He loves turning things backwards and upside down. He tells you God doesn't love you when He does. He tells you you're, you're, you are not wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight when you are that you've not been fully and completely forgiven when you have, that Christ is not going to return soon when He most certainly will, and the list goes on. But there's a strange paradox also with true Christianity. The way up is down, that is down into death, death to self, crucified with Christ, a truth which, which tends to confound even the most wise. The common sense gospel today says that self is alive and self ought to work and self is under the law. The common sense gospel today that dominates, permeates most of modern Christianity seems right, but we know that there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to counsel. I turn on the news and what do I hear being seriously discussed? I, 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 I would say, I swear, I, I have to. I wonder, am I, you know, what planet am I on? Exchanging what creates and gives life for that which destroys, re rejecting what works for that which does not. I have spoken so much in the past about how so many natural things in God's created order reflect things which are spiritual, from the planting of a seed to the to the air that we breathe. The symbolism that's seen in the words earth, water, air, wind, and, and countless other terms that God used to reflect spiritual realities. Satan would have us believe Christianity is progressive. It's ever evolving. It's changing for the better. That there's always room for improvement. These lies are very seductive when considered apart from the truth of God's Word. Very seductive indeed. Few would argue that it's, it's not one's best interest to be better. I mean, few would argue it's, it's not one's best interest to be competitive or to be proud of one's own accomplishments, much of, of which has some merit as far as the natural world is concerned, but which absolutely carry no weight in matters which are spiritual. No wonder the antithesis to true Christianity is referred to by the Holy Spirit as natural, earthy, fleshly, Yet that's where so-called Christianity today abides. That's where it lives and breathes and works. I've published videos showing how that things didn't used to be this way. That there was a time roughly 400 years ago when the purity of the gospel of Christ was preached and commonly accepted as truth and pointed out as well how that, that changed in America in which the pursuit of equal opportunity as a nation influenced the religious leaders over time, 
thereby altering forever the landscape of Christianity as a whole. We as God's children are living in perilous times, yet it is an exciting time to be alive because Jesus Christ, our blessed hope, will soon arrive. So that's it. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for your continued prayers for this ministry and for your support, all your messages, your emails. Until next time, thanks for watching.